Like clockwork, Apple releases a new flagship phone every year, just like they've done since the start in 2007. 14 years later, we have the 15th generation iPhone, the iPhone 13 Pro, which is technically the 32nd iPhone. Yeah, Apple wasn't really good with numbers. As always, everything is better, but that doesn't mean the best. But this year, it seemed like Apple listened to the complaints and fixed most of the issues that people have had with a few to many years of iPhone generations. But there's more to talk about when we look at this thick, heavy, and super fast iPhone 13 Pro. Hello everyone, this is Matt from Real World Review, and you know what to do with the social media listed above. Let's get started. While the screen technically isn't the best out there, it is still really good. It's pretty much the same as last year, being a 6.1 inch notched Super Retina XDR OLED display with a resolution of 1170 by 2532, making it slightly better than 1080p and giving us 460 pixels per inch, the second highest of any iPhone. The iPhone minis, which is the 12 and 13, get the crowns at 476 pixels per inch. This year though, the Pro models finally get ProMotion display. I guess third time's a charm. Finally, the Pro models get a promotion. Okay, those are really bad jokes, but it means that we are finally able to move from the 60Hz screen to a possible 120Hz refresh rate. Now you can use the iPhone like most flagship Android phones have been able to do for a year or so. But this case is very interesting. For me, I ended up using this with another device that has a 60Hz refresh rate, and while I love to see it on the iPhone, I didn't get the same experience as I do on like an iPad or even a 90Hz refresh rate Android device. This could be because I'm just used to it, but iPhones are already pretty smooth in the first place. Either way, I love to see it, and it didn't really affect the battery life like everyone assumed it would, thanks to that adaptive refresh rate. It would be nice to have the option to lock it at 120 hertz, but maybe in eight years, Apple will finally give us that option. To be fair, most Android phones don't allow you to lock it at 90 or 120 hertz, so I'm not really gonna scold Apple for this one. I have spent half of this section talking about the refresh rate because that's pretty much it. Images look amazing on this display, but at 6.1 inches, this doesn't really give you the right landscape for watching HDR content, even though it does still look really nice. As for the brightness, we are looking at a 25% peak brightness increase from the iPhone 12 Pro all the way up to 1000 nits in normal situations. You shouldn't experience issues with the brightness unless the phone gets really hot and starts dimming. This is something you may not experience much in the winter, but I'm already experiencing the phone dimming from normal scrolling in like 70 degree weather. So you do know that summertime will bring you a bunch of situations where the screen dims really early on the iPhone 13 Pros. Hopefully Apple will have a way to prevent this. As for the notch area, I really don't get it. Yes, it's a little bit smaller, but it's still big, and it doesn't add anything by shrinking it. The fact that Apple even talked about it is beyond me. The one thing I do realize, though, is that we haven't seen 3D Touch since the iPhone XS Max, but every year Apple makes this phone feel cheap when they choose haptic touch over 3D Touch. As I always say, haptic touch is really just a vibration when you long press. That's it. Even though the vibrating motor is pretty nice on this phone, it's still not a feature, so stop calling it that. Oh yes, there is a ceramic shield, but I assume it's very similar to last year's iPhone 12 Pro, which, shocker, will break if dropped hard enough. As always, the cameras are amazing. You actually have seen a few videos filmed from this phone, and you probably know by now that I use the iPhone XS Max to film pretty much all my videos. So you already know that video looks good, but photos look amazing as well. I can sit here and explain to you what's so special about these, but honestly, it's just easier to show you. So I will, and here's some music as well.
Now, I was skeptical, like you would be. I mean, Apple has kept the 12 megapixel camera on these phones since the iPhone 6S. But when you compare these shots to older iPhones, the iPhone 13 Pro definitely produces higher quality images out of those 12 megapixel sensors. But to break it down, you get three sensors, all 12 megapixels, one being an ultra wide, one being a standard wide, and the last being a three times optical zoom telephoto sensor. You saw the images, so you know what they can do, especially with that main sensor and the sensor shift stabilization. Every year, Apple allows us to be more and more confident with point and shoot, and this year was obviously no different. Night shots are amazing, but honestly, I don't know what it's trying to do. For me, I want my night shots to have more detail, not just be bright. We get the same true tone flash as normal, but it's really meant to be a flashlight. Then there's these things called photographic styles, which I fail to understand. So they take the shot, but it's not a filter. It actually takes one shot with the settings that you set it on, so you can reverse it, but not in a simple way. Or at least if you don't know how to edit photos, it's not gonna be simple. Personally, I go with the stock settings because that's just how I am, but I guess if you had a style for your job, like if you're a photographer for weddings or other stuff like that, this would actually make sense. It would be nice to see Apple either add an option to easily reverse a style or maybe take a shot with the normal camera and then with that style on there. I don't know, maybe it's something for a future update. Speaking of, the macro mode that we get from the focusable ultra wide camera is good and really close, but automatically switching is beyond frustrating to me. This even happens when you're using the telephoto lens, which doesn't make sense. Hopefully by the time this video comes out, Apple will have a fix to prevent that from happening, which they said that it will. I'm just not sure how they missed that. As for video, like I said, you know what it looks like, because I film most of my videos in 4K 60 frames per second anyway. You do get ProRes video, which takes up a lot of space, but really only pros should be using that. I don't know what it is though, so I guess I'm not really a pro. All I know is that it's high quality video, but at a very high bitrate, so this will fill up your phone really quickly. Then we get cinematic mode, which is alright. We get a 4K version of this on lots of Samsung phones, but on the iPhone, it definitely does look a lot better, even though it's limited to 1080p, but the whole thing is confusing. This is made for making it look like a movie, but it only shoots at 1080p, not 4K. Then, it's at 16x9, not 21x9 or 18x9. Then, it shoots at 30 frames per second, not 24 frames per second, like most movies are shot. I'm not mad about the last thing, but the first two don't really make sense to me. Either way, it's definitely a fun feature, but the whole cinematic option of it doesn't really make sense. It really is just really good portrait video. There's a lot about cinematic mode, which I didn't really go over like when it comes to editing and stuff like that, but I did notice a few more things after playing around with it. First of all, it works on the normal sensor and the telephoto sensor, even at night, but it is kind of weird when it's a low light situation or when there's a lot of subjects in the picture like this. And I thought I might as well make a video, so I made a short video, which I'll show you right now. The volume and everything is stock how it comes, I just edited everything together. So this one's only 30 seconds, but I do have a longer version at the end of this review video if you do want to watch that. Enjoy. Okay, so let's get started. Name? Matt. I'm not gonna tell you my last name. Good, good, good. So you understand why- So you're not gonna say your name? No, I'm the cop. I don't have a name. Okay. So you're here because- I didn't do anything. Wait, did you just get a haircut? <sighs> yes, I did get a haircut, but why am I here? It says here, end of script. What? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really understand here. Let me show you. So I'm free to go, right? Dude, this is your house. I'm not even a cop. I don't even have a name. You know what? I'm, just, I'm done. I'm just gonna go check and see what's in the fridge. You want anything? Okay, I'm just gonna go. Yes, please, doesn't matter, I don't, I don't know. Then for the front camera, we get the same thing as the rear camera, but this one does not focus, which is always beyond me. It also isn't stabilized, which is normal, but you get access to ProRes video and cinematic mode, which is surprising to me. However, with the front camera, I'm not really good with using the latter. Of course, it is nice to see that whether you use the front camera or the rear camera, you can be confident with your photo and video capabilities. Even though this is not an S model iPhone, it is very similar to last year's iPhone 12 Pro. 
We keep the same stainless steel band on the side, as well as a little 5G ultra-wide antenna cutout. The volume and power buttons are lower, for some reason. But besides that, in a much larger camera area, it is very similar to the iPhone 12 Pro. We get the same lightning plug on the bottom, which apparently does 23 watts of charging, which is technically faster than the iPhone 12 Pro, which is around 20 to 22 watts max. Then we get three holes for the microphone, and five more for the bottom loudspeaker. This is paired with the one at the very top of the phone screen, giving us a nice and loud stereo setup, which is adequate. It's not the best, but in no ways does it sound bad. The screen is flat, again, just like the matte glass on the back, which does still curve up for the camera area. The camera area is so big though that it feels like it's literally half of the phone's thickness on the back. And that's it really. The phone is 0.3 inches and weighs 204 grams, which makes it a thick and heavy phone. But I can't really hate on Apple for this one because it did give us a larger battery with that added thickness and weight, which is what everyone asked for. But I do find that this phone feels heavier than I would like, which is honestly the reason why I got the Pro instead of the Pro Max. The phone is still water and dust resistant, up to 6 meters, or almost 20 feet, for 30 minutes. Nope, not waterproof like everyone thinks, even though Apple never said that any of their devices are waterproof. Like I said earlier, this phone has a variable refresh rate maxing at 120 hertz. Well, technically adaptive, so it can go all the way down to 10 hertz, hitting 12 different rates listed above. This is actually more than the five that are given on the iPads, but lacking 90 hertz is interesting to me. But to power this and much more, we are given the best of the best, but also not, at least when you compare it to the M1 iPads. The iPhone 13 Pro features the best A15 chip, this one having 5 GPU cores compared to the 4 core one found in the regular 13, and somehow being better than the underpowered one found in the iPad mini 6. Also, why does the chip look different in the iPhone 13 Pro specs when compared to the iPad mini 6? Not really sure what Apple's doing here. The interesting thing is that Apple says that it's 50% better or 50% faster than the Android competition, and if Geekbench is a good way to test this, they're actually telling the truth. With that said, the performance difference from the iPhone 12 is pretty small. I mean, the iPhone 11 Pro Max gives me pretty much the same numbers as the Samsung Z Flip 3, but we already knew that Apple processors are really fast. GPU performance is dramatically different, but again, the iPhone 12 was so good that that extra performance is probably just to support that 120Hz refresh rate when gaming. To power the phone, we are given a slightly larger 11.97 watt hour battery, which is almost 10% bigger than the 10.78 watt battery found in the iPhone 12 Pro. Maybe I got a bad phone, or maybe I'm just not used to moving from a Pro Max to a normal Pro, but my aging 11 Pro Max battery gives me pretty much the same performance as the 13 Pro that I have. Still, really awesome battery for the heavy usage that it goes through, but not the battery champ I expected. Either way, charging is actually fairly fast when using a MacBook charger, giving me 55% after 30 minutes of charging while using the phone. We still get wireless charging as well as MagSafe charging, the latter being 15 watts of charging while the former is 5 watts of charging, but wow, it feels super slow on my wireless Samsung charger that I have. This year, Apple gave us four options, then four more. You get four colors, which I ended up going with graphite. The blue looks nice, but I would love to see a midnight green or even a deep red, just not a light blue. The other colors suck, honestly. The gold and the silver, they look really similar. After you choose the color, you get 128, 256, 512 gigabytes, or a full one terabyte, making this the second phone to feature one terabyte in something we haven't seen since the Samsung S10 Plus. With the added ProRes video and, well, that's it. Other than having a lot of videos, the one terabyte step doesn't really make sense, but it definitely fits the Pro name. Now that I think about it, this is actually the most Pro phone that Apple has ever released. If only they gave us a USB-C 3.2 port. Why do you need this phone? Well, obviously you don't need this phone, until you actually do. First of all, one terabyte is a lot of space, and $500 more than the 128 gigabyte standard which could be spent on iCloud storage and give you two terabytes of cloud storage for a little over four years. That's something to think about, especially when you consider four years ago, the max storage on an iPhone was 256 gigabytes on the iPhone 8. Realistically though, this storage is mainly for people that need access to every video on their phone on the go, mostly for work. So the extra price could really just be a write-off. 
Now there are many reasons to upgrade, but here's where you come into consideration for this video. If you have an iPhone 11 series or older, this is definitely worth the upgrade. The cameras, while similar to the iPhone 11 Pro, are dramatically different. The LiDAR sensor seems to be used for focusing with videos and photos, but iPhones are already really good without that sensor, at least if you have like an iPhone 10 or newer. Compared to the iPhone 11 Pro, the processor is 30 to 43% better, with the graphics processing giving me 107% increase when compared to the iPhone 13 Pro. Then when we add battery life, MagSafe, design change, and overall quality of life upgrades that every generation brings, this seems to be a perfect upgrade, especially if you're anywhere in between an iPhone 6S and an iPhone 10S on the iPhone list. But with the 12, this is kind of a difficult choice because now it seems like there's just quality of life upgrades, better battery life, better camera performance, 120 hertz display, nicer but not better notch, and well, that's it. The three times zoom is better, but sometimes leaves shots looking too zoomed in, which feels weird to complain about, honestly. The already amazing processor gets better and even adds better battery life. Really think about this, the iPhone 11 Pro Max Geekbench scores are on par with the Snapdragon 888 chip that's found in the Samsung S21 and Z Flip 3. Apple really is ahead of the game with the processor and just made it better, but more efficient as well. The screen is 1000 nits, which is brighter than the 800 found in the iPhone 12 Pro, but it's already super bright. So it's hard to say whether you should upgrade, but if you feel that the iPhone 12 is lacking, then it would be hard to say that the iPhone 13 Pro would not fix those issues. After all, the iPhone 13 should be called the 12S, but the screen is what makes it a really big jump, even though it technically is a small difference. So to recap, if you have an iPhone 11 series or older, this is definitely worth it. But if you have an iPhone 12 series, this is something to consider, but this might not be what you're looking for. And if you're an Android user, I would say that this is worth it as long as you appreciate iOS 15, which for me really needs a jailbreak. And that's my review on the iPhone 13 Pro. Honestly, I feel like it's still missing some things, but I feel like that's how every iPhone review is. This year's lineup is really spectacular, but I feel like it lacks any excitement. We got a new color and updates to already amazing things. It really does feel like iPhones are like cars. You need to wait a couple years for the upgrade to be worth it. But also this is one of the iPhones I've been waiting for. I will actually take advantage of the one terabyte option, but not so much of what the A15 is capable of. The high refresh rate is a welcome addition, but iPhones already have smooth screens as it is. So 120 Hertz didn't feel as significant as I expected. But all in all, I have to say that this is a first iPhone that really earns the Pro name. Hopefully you enjoyed my review of the iPhone 13 Pro, the best iPhone, because it has to be. Hope you have a wonderful day, and as always, thanks for watching. Okay, so let's get started. Name? Matt. I'm not going to tell you my last name. Good, good, good. So, you understand why... So, you're not going to say your name? No, I'm the cop. I don't have a name. Okay, so you're here because... I didn't do anything. Wait, did you just get a haircut? <sighs> yes, I did get a haircut. But why am I here? It says here, end of script. What? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really understand here. Let me show you. So, I'm free to go, right? Dude, this is your house. I'm not even a cop. I don't even have a name. You know what? I'm just, I'm done. I'm just gonna go check and see what's in the fridge. You want anything? Okay, I'm just gonna go. Yes, please. Doesn't matter. I don't, I don't know. How many versions of this do you have? You know, I haven't really thought that far. Maybe there's gonna be a bunch of different cuts. Maybe, I don't know. Wait, you did get a haircut, but... You didn't get a haircut in this one. Or maybe you did. Did I get my haircut? So many different things. How does this even show off cinematic mode? Yeah, I know. Should have just done regular video, but I guess it's cool. I know. I use cinematic mode. I don't really like it. It's 1080p at 30 frames per second. You really should have just shown off regular mode instead of cinematic mode. Uh, I mean, normally I shoot at like 4K 60 frames per second, and generally that feels better for me, especially for like moving and stuff like that. But this is supposed to be able to focus better and yeah, I know, you don't care. How could we have made it better? Oh yeah, you don't say anything, I'm just saying this now. Yeah, I know, pretty nice, right? Yeah.
Yeah, thanks. Yep, I'm gonna leave. <laughs> they probably didn't say anything either. Okay, um, I think it's the end of this bit. Want any coffee?